Well, Daniel mentioned a few moments ago that we're starting this series on Colossians. And Colossians is one of my favourite letters of the Apostle Paul. It's one of Paul's most famous letters, one of his most powerful and attractive letters. It's a short letter, and so we're going to be working through this letter in our coming months together, especially in June and July. Up there on the screen, you'll see a map uh, helping us to understand a little bit about the geography of what lies behind Colossians. Uh, There on the right-hand side of the map, you'll see a kind of a white area that's uh, in modern-day Turkey. That's where Colossi was in the old Roman province of Asia Minor. And over on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the country that today we call Italy. And the capital of Italy, of course, is Rome. And we're not quite sure where Paul was, but probably he was in Rome. He was in prison in Rome. And he sends this letter off. um, And he sends it to Colossae to be read to the Christians there and other churches in in the nearby area as well. The theme for Colossians is summarised for us very neatly by Paul in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, where Paul says, Jesus Christ, our life. And as I thought about those words, I thought, what a beautiful summary of Paul's heart and Paul's message as he writes to his Christian friends in Colossae. When Paul says that Jesus Christ is our life, what does he mean? Well, I think that little diagram on the screen maybe helps us to understand that. It means that Jesus Christ should be at the centre of our lives. Jesus Christ should be at the centre of the church as well. Not on the periphery, not on the circumference, not hidden in a corner somewhere of our lives at our church, but Jesus Christ should be our life right at the centre. It's a theme that Paul needed to emphasise to these Christians in the city of Colossae. And it's a theme that's so relevant for us today as well. You see, the Colossian church was in a situation where it was being tempted. Tempted to move beyond the basic message of the gospel of Christ. Uh, The simple message that Jesus is Saviour and Lord. And the culture around them was influencing them, influencing them and teaching them that in order to be spiritual, in other words, in order to grow as a person, in order to be enriched in our spiritual lives, we had to, we have to add extra things to the basic message of the gospel, adding extra things like religious rites and rituals, disciplines, uh, more sophisticated knowledge, superstition, astrology, worship of idols and spirit beings, or some kind of compelling experience. And the problem is, as you allow all those things to start crowding into your life and your spirituality, Jesus Christ moves to the periphery. Jesus Christ moves to the circumference rather than being at the heart in the centre. So Paul is concerned as he writes this letter off to the Christians at Colossae. He wants these new believers to stop drifting away, drifting away from the supreme importance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see how relevant, can't you, this is to our own time and our own personal experience. We too live in a culture in modern day Australia We too face pressures every day from our culture to add things to the basic gospel message. And why do we add? We add because we want to be close to God or we want to reach our full potential as human beings. And we need Paul's reminder that Jesus Christ is our life. Jesus is the supreme saviour and Lord. And all of our thinking, all of our words, all of our behaviour should be shaped by Jesus, not by the other forces, the additional things that our society tries to push upon us. Now in this opening part of Paul's letter, Paul reminds the Christians of this basic message of the gospel, the message about Christ. Have a look with me again at chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul reminds them that the Colossian Christians first heard the gospel from this man called Epaphras. 
not from Paul himself. In fact, it seems likely that Paul had never even been there to Colossae, but he had sent somebody by the name of Epaphras. Have a look at verse 6 of chapter 1. In the same way, the gospel... Sorry, it's uh, verse 7. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Now, Epaphras was originally from the town of Colossae. We learn that later on in this very letter. And Paul had sent Epaphras to that town to share with them the good news, uh, the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only Colossae, but nearby towns and nearby districts as well. And we learn here from chapter 1 that when they heard the gospel, the gospel of Christ had an immediate impact on these people in Colossae. Let's have a look again at chapter 1 and verse 6. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit, growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. The gospel changes lives. A couple of nights ago, Joy and I had the privilege of um, going and hearing from a missionary family. And it just so happens that this uh, missionary is a nephew of Joy. So we feel an interest, we pray for them, and we support them financially and their work as well. They've been over in Paraguay in South America for a number of years, have come back. Uh, they're sharing with their supporters, and they have to go back with their three children, in fact, four children by the end of this year, uh, back to Paraguay again. They're both doctors. So part of what they do is practicing medicine, but also they're very passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus, especially in people in very remote tribal areas and agricultural areas of Paraguay. And they told some stories, showed us some photos of people hearing the good news about Jesus for the first time and the, the change it makes in their lives. People who are scared of evil spirits, people who live in superstition, people who are slaves in lots of different ways and hearing the great news about God's love in Christ, liberating them, setting them free and discovering their sense of identity and self-worth in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is talking about here in chapter 1 and verse 6. But notice carefully something important here in verse 6. As Paul summarises for them what the gospel message is all about, he does it with one particular word. And it's a word that we've already sung about today and reflected on at the communion table. It's the word grace. There it is at the end of verse 6. The day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Well, we talked a little bit about grace around the Lord's table. What does it mean? And I shared that uh, acrostic G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. When I think about grace... I think of it as God's generosity, God's overflowing generosity in providing salvation for unworthy sinners, sinners like you and me. And that salvation is offered through Jesus' sacrificial death. But grace is not just God's salvation, it's God's daily empowerment, God's daily enabling of the believer in Christ. Grace is the gospel in one word. And we sang before the wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, where John Newton reminds us that grace is always amazing. Grace is always incredible and surprising and overwhelming. Why? Because God showers so many blessings, so many gifts on everybody who trusts in Jesus as Saviour and Lord. I love the line in the hymn Amazing Grace where John Newton says, How precious did that grace appear, the hour we first believe. It's true, isn't it? The very moment of conversion, the moment of placing our trust in Jesus as Saviour and Lord, suddenly the grace of God is amazing to us and incredible and overwhelming. Now notice here in chapter 1 that Paul starts to explain and remind the Colossian Christians what some of those blessings are and free gifts. Um, in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, for example, he mentions three things that God has given to the Colossian Christians. Paul is so grateful and thankful to God because God has given the Colossian Christians faith, 
and love and hope. Sound familiar? Let's look at those words. I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Here are three gifts that God has given to those who trust in Jesus. And of course, these three words are often used by Paul, aren't they? Uh, most famously at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul says, these three things abide. They remain faith, hope, and love. And a number of other times in Paul's letters, Paul refers to the incredible importance of these three qualities in the lives of God's people. Faith is commitment to Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus, who is God's Messiah, God's appointed King. Love means commitment to do good to other people. And particularly here in these verses, Paul is talking about love for our sisters and brothers in the Christian family, all the saints, all of God's people. It means a concern for others who are Christians, a caring love that counts no sacrifice too great for people that we love in Christ. And then that glorious word hope that is there in verse verse 5. Hope refers to what we look forward to in the future with joyful certainty and expectancy and confidence. The glorious reward when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The future blessedness of the people of God. Now, of course, when I emphasise that these are three gifts, there's a responsibility for all of us to be nurturing these gifts. Every day I need to be growing in my faith and my love and my hope. And Paul is encouraging them to do so, of course, in, in his words here, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. But they begin as gifts of God, expressions of the grace of God. And God's grace brings other blessings to his people as well and gifts to every believer in Christ. I draw your attention particularly to the verses from verse 12 through to verse 14 of our chapter. <coughs> Paul reminds the Colossian Christians that God has saved us from all kinds of things, saved us from sin, saved us from darkness, saved us from slavery. Let me read verse 12. Give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Qualified us. What a lovely word that is. That means that at the time of our conversion, God declares us to be fit to share in the heritage of God's people. Previously, we were unfit for that privilege. But now in Christ, we belong. We belong to God's kingdom of light and truth. But notice also in verses 13 and 14, God's grace also includes us in his redemptive plans. Let me read these words. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow. What a power pack passage this is. All these beautiful words that really we could take the whole sermon just to reflect on these key words in these verses. As Paul explains, here is what God has done for you from the very moment when you trust in Jesus as your saviour and your king. You're rescued, Paul says in verse 13. That means we're delivered from ignorance, and from falsehood and from sin and from evil powers. And we're brought from one place to another. We're re-established under the sovereign rule of the Lord Christ. Uh, whenever I see that word here, I, I think of the, the first fleet uh, when, when those convicts came and soldiers as well and others all the way from England out to Sydney. Uh, they were transferred to the opposite side of the world and they were going to live under a, a governor, under the authority certainly of the British Crown, but certainly under different leaders. 
It's that same kind of image. We've been brought, we've been transferred, we've been shipped out and shipped to a new place, in a sense, with a new king and a new ruler. And then we've been redeemed, verse 14, where there's a release, a payment price has been made, and we, as a result, we're released. And also notice the lovely word forgiveness at the end of verse 14. Our sins have been removed from us, so no longer are there barriers between us and God that separate us. Now Paul is using all of these wonderful words here in these verses to remind us of what God's grace has done for us when we respond to the message of his grace in the gospel. But also notice here in our passage in chapter 1 that as Paul describes God's gracious activity on behalf of all believers, Paul encourages us to respond in our minds and our hearts to God's grace, to respond with gratitude. You see, Paul himself had learnt the art of being thankful to God. It's a theme that we see so often in Paul's letters. Even when life for Paul was full of hardship, full of problems, full of difficulties, Paul learnt the art of being thankful to God. And one of the great examples of that that I find is uh, Acts chapter 16. And there we read of Paul in prison with Silas. And you'll recall they're, they're in Philippi and they've been arrested, they've been beaten, they've been mistreated, their feet are in the stocks, uh, in a lot of pain and suffering. And yet there they are at midnight singing hymns and praising God and praying. Quite amazing. And we see something similar here in chapter 1 and verse 3, where Paul says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray to you. It's incredible, isn't it, to think that here is Paul in prison. And he refers to that a number of times in chapter 4 of Colossians, that he's in chains, and he talks about his fellow prisoner. It's remarkable and it's very impressive to me that Paul could be thankful in such a situation. And Paul expected all Christians to be like him in this regard, to learn the art of thanksgiving as well. It's one of the signs of a healthy Christian life, that we're full of gratitude and thanksgiving to God. And that's why in the opening part of this letter, Paul dwells on God's grace God's grace revealed in the gospel of Christ. And he wants us to think about all of the countless blessings and gifts and privileges that God has given to all who trust Jesus as Saviour and Lord. And then the fitting response is thanksgiving to God. God's grace should always lead to gratitude in our own personal lives. But let me also draw your attention to Paul's prayer in chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. This emphasis on gratitude is here in Paul's prayer as well. I love this prayer. It's a very inspiring model of how to pray. Often we don't know what to pray for when we pray for others, even praying for ourselves or our families or missionaries or our church or whatever. One thing that's useful to do is to go to the prayers of the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul. So often there's great prayers here that we can draw from and learn about how we can pray for others. But notice the content here, uh, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 1. Paul prays that the Colossians may know God better, and that they may know God's will better as well. He says in verse 9, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Not only knowing God better and knowing God's will, but also our lives should walk worthy of Christ and a God who is so worthy. Look at the way Paul puts it in the first part of verse 10. That you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And then Paul goes on to explain some practical ways that that should happen in our lives. Four ways that we should live worthy of the Lord. The first way is to live a productive moral life. 
So Paul says in verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work. And again in verse 10 he talks about deepening our understanding about God, growing in the knowledge of God. And verse 11, another way that we live this worthy life is patience and long-suffering. Let me read verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. What a wonderful verse that is. I wonder if you're facing a situation at the moment where you need endurance and you need patience. We all do, don't we, in some different areas of our lives. Because life is often hard, even for faithful followers of Christ. But notice the words that Paul uses here in verse 11. He talks about the mighty power of God. All power according to his glorious might. That power is available to you and to me to strengthen us and give us patience and endurance. There's a good verse to write out on a card and stick on your fridge or put on your bedside table or put in your diary or calendar or whatever. Just reflect on verse 11 and see what a difference that makes to you in this coming week. And then the fourth way that Paul talks about that we live worthily of God is that we live a grateful life, grateful for the blessings of redemption. Paul says in verse 12, giving joyful thanks to the Father. So Paul himself is a great model, isn't he? He's a great example of being thankful to God. We've seen that already in chapter 1 and verse 3. And he expects the Colossian Christians to do the same, to joyfully give thanks to the Lord. Well, let's take a few moments to think about this on a practical level. What would it look like for you and for me to live grateful, thankful lives before God on a daily basis? What are some tips? What are some ideas? How does the rubber meet the road, uh, to use that expression? Well, let me share a couple of things that I've found helpful myself, and I struggle sometimes in this area, uh, but there's a few ways that have helped me and encouraged me to be a thankful, grateful person on a daily basis. One way is to remember the ACTS acrostic, A-C-T-S. I'm sure many of you have heard about this before. A represents adoration. C represents confession to God, confessing our sins. T represents thanksgiving. And S is supplication, praying for others, bringing their needs before God. That's a great outline for prayer, a balanced, holistic way of thinking about prayer. So every time I pray to God, Acts is a great model for me, and that means thanksgiving and gratitude to God should be part of my regular praying. It should be true of our church as well, of course. When we gather here on the Lord's Day and we express our worship to God, when we express our prayers corporately to God, thanksgiving needs to be part of that, and ACTS is a healthy model for us. Another thing that helps me to be a grateful and thankful person on a daily basis is the Old Testament Psalms. I love to read the Psalms and every day I'm reading at least a few of them and meditating upon them. And so often the Old Testament Psalms encourage us to respond to God with gratitude. Last week, for example, when John Buckle was preaching to us, he preached from Psalm number 8. And it's a beautiful psalm of thanksgiving and wonder before God, celebrating the creator God, the wonders of God's creation, and responding to our our creator God with joy and and, and with uh, thanks for his majestic power and his loving care. Late last year, someone suggested that they like to uh, read Psalm 103 each day around midday. Psalm 103, Daniel read a little bit of that earlier in our service. But Psalm 103 is a beautiful psalm of thanksgiving and celebration of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And I thought, that's a good idea. I'm going to set that as a goal in the year 2021. So most days, I don't do it every day, but most days of the week, around about midday, I turn to Psalm 103 and I read it from start to finish. And as I read it, I think, wow, Lord, so many things that I can be grateful for, so many things to thank you for, and it lifts up my heart right in the middle of my day. 
in gratitude and thanks to the Lord. Another thing that I find helpful is singing Christian songs and hymns. That's a great way to remind ourselves of God's grace, God's blessings, and responding to him with grateful emotions. And part of Christian music, of course, is listening to other people singing as often as we can. So you might be driving in the car and listening to a CD or a podcast or whatever, um, listening to Christian songs and music, reminding ourselves of why we can be constantly thankful to the Lord. And notice that Paul in this particular passage in Colossians 1 directs Christians to recall the blessings and gifts that God has so graciously given to all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen those already, haven't we, this morning? Paul reminds them of the gifts of faith and love and hope. He reminds them that God has qualified believers and redeemed us so that now we belong to the kingdom of God. And Paul expects us, notice here, to thank God not only with our minds, but also with our emotions and our hearts as well. Chapter 1, verse 12, joyful thanks to the Lord. Not just gritting, not just doing it because we have to, but there's a sense of joy and celebration because he's such a good and kind God. As it says up there up on the screen, gratitude for God's grace enables me to live in his joy. If we want to experience a joyful life, here is one of the keys to focus on the grace of God and express our gratitude and thanks to him on a daily basis. But before we finish this morning, finish this message, I want us just to stand back for a moment and reflect on why is it that Paul begins his letter in this particular way as he opens the letter to the Colossians. He's doing something more here than just being polite. He's doing something more than just sending greetings to the Colossian Christians. He's even doing something more than just mentioning, by the way, the things that he's praying for. Paul is very intentionally here in these opening verses of Colossians, starting to introduce themes that he's going to develop later in the letter, particularly one theme, the theme of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. Jesus Christ, says Paul, is the supreme saviour and Lord. And next week, Daniel's going to be preaching to us from the next part of Colossians, verses 15 to 24. I encourage you to read that passage every day in this coming week, full of deep and weighty thoughts about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, God the Father has brought his grace into our lives. Paul is saying to us, as we reflect on that grace, our minds and hearts should respond with gratitude. So we don't need to be shaped by the culture around us. We don't need to add extra things to the basic gospel message. Additional things like the things I mentioned earlier, religious rites or disciplines, more sophisticated knowledge, superstition, astrology, worship of angels, worship and even fear of angelic beings, spirit beings, or even some compelling spiritual experience. The gospel message is adequate, is what Paul is saying. It is not inadequate. That's one reason why I like the way at Kajimba Baptist Church, at the end of most of our worship services, we sing that very simple little song, Keep Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That that simple song is reminding us each week to keep Jesus at the centre and make sure that our thoughts about his glory and grace shape us and shape our hearts and our affections and our thinking. So often what we see here in the opening letter part of Colossians is what Paul does in his letters. Yes, he writes out of concern. But before he gets to his concerns... Usually Paul has something positive to say. Before he warns about false directions, Paul accentuates the positive 
The reason why he does that is because he wants our love and our affections to move in the right direction. And the positive truth that Paul is presenting about the Lord Jesus Christ is so attractive, so compellingly attractive, that the false alternatives should become less attractive. True for the Colossians, true for you and me as well. The gospel message is about the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel message is about the grace of God. The gospel message is about God's blessings for all believers in Christ. And as we respond to that gospel message, as we express to God our joyful thanksgiving, what happens? Something happens in our hearts and emotions, doesn't it? We're filled with satisfaction, filled with delight, filled with pleasure in what God has so graciously given to us in Jesus Christ. Filled with joy because Jesus Christ is God's supreme Saviour and Lord. What Paul is saying here is so true, isn't it? Jesus Christ truly is our life.